1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Paul speaking of the Thessalonians or to the Thessalonians of the message that's coming back to him from all the different communities around Thessalonica. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus Christ, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This verse that we've just quoted is often used to refer to and to give reference to the conversion that God brings to someone when they're saved. The, the saved person, when they come to God, is turned by God to God. And immediately, once they've turned to God, there begins this pivot in their life away from the idols that have been their focus to serve God himself and God alone. And they're not saved by this turning. They're simply saved by confessing their sins and putting, putting their faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work for them at the cross. His blood shed to take the punishment for their sins. His resurrected life received by them through faith. And in that, the reception of all of his righteousness. In other words, all the bad that we've done on him. All the good that he did in his life on us. And we take that all by faith. But this faith, this saving faith, immediately releases us into a converting or a turning that God coordinates in our lives. And you can count on this. If a person by the power of God has turned to Jesus Christ and turned to completely in faith to him, that turn will initiate a moment in their life in which they begin to walk away from all the idols that have been in their past and all the things that they would served and all the things that they would bowed down before. At that very moment, there arises within their life a divinely orchestrated activity in which they seek to, in that turn, to serve and live for God. They, they begin to immediately look for opportunities to seek God in his word, and they start reading the Bible, for example, or they get busy going to church. They just go to it as often as they can to study and learn and commune with other believers. This is what happened to the early church. We read what happened on the day of Pentecost, and immediately on that moment, the, 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 a body of believers were initiated in a pursuit of knowing God and fellowshipping together and worshiping to God together and praying together, and their, and their life began to take a change. They, they began to loosen hold of the things that they had confidence in before, and they began to share all things in common with one another, and they began to open up their lives to receive fellowship with one another, and they began to go house to house seeking out community with one another. And this, this is all an expression of this change, this conversion, this activation in their life. And, and not only that, they begin to clean out their house. They begin to look at their life and see those things that are not in their spirit in accord with what God has done in their life. And they begin to jettison those things from their life. And so you'll find a person who's a new believer. I had one brother tell me he became a new believer that he had this, he had this image of a dolphin that he thought was great. Now listen, this is... It's not necessarily, they're not necessarily neat and refined and it's not as if everything they do is what the Bible tells them they have to do, but they're just willing to go to the extra mile to remove from their lives things that don't seem to accord with the life they have in Jesus Christ. When this person believed in God and received him as a savior, they began to look at this image that they had in the center of the house as like an idol that they had used to worship nature. And so the first thing they did was take this idol, this carving of a dolphin, and throw it in the garbage. Well, it's not necessary that he did that, but it's the kind of thing that happens. This young couple that I met, that I met at this conference who had become missionaries, the husband told me when he became a believer he'd never been a part of a church before in his life. He didn't know where to go, so for three years he just read his Bible. And then something stirred him. He realized there were actually places where he could go and worship with other believers, and he began to understand that he was kind of listening to Christian radio programs, and then he looked up for a church, and he found the address of a church, and he went to the church, and he went to the very first service, and then he walked up to the pastor at the front of the service and said, this is my, you know, my name is, I can't give you his name because they're in a closed access country, and I just want to know, what do I have to do to become a missionary? <laughs> He'd been reading his Bible and thought, I've got to serve God. I've got to give my life. I, I think I'm supposed to go somewhere around the world to proclaim what I've discovered in Jesus Christ. It's the kind of thing that happens. 
that conversion that's being spoken about here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, but another thing that takes place, they, they get active, but another thing happens. Not only do they get active, but they also begin to settle down and wait. They become active in one sense, and they become waiting and patiently waiting in another sense. The person who finds Jesus Christ or is found by Christ begins a life of waiting. They uh, quickly begin to realize how weak they are in their own flesh, how worldly is the community that they live in, how wicked is the age that they're a part of. And they begin to wait and long and look for heaven to heaven for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in which he will finalize the outcomes of his kingdom and finalizing glory over all the earth. And they, they long for this glorious kingdom to arrive where Christ will appear and his power and his presence will reign upon the earth. And at that moment, he, he will deal with and he will transform them from their weak bodies to glorified bodies and he will change the community from all its worldliness to a, a community that's serving and seeking out his purposes and he will do away with a rod of iron all the wickedness of this age and establish an age and a kingdom of glory and they long for that they begin to long for that and look for that and they they read their bibles and they realize that even before the lord jesus went to the cross he spoke about this coming in the clouds of glory to establish his rule upon the earth and they say yes jesus you're my king and Make your kingdom on this earth. And they begin to pray after they were taught, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so though they became active, at the same moment they became waiting. Now listen, these people in Thessalonica that Paul is writing to had never known this truth before. There's nothing in their history or in their annals that would have introduced them this idea, nothing in their traditions that would have produced this expectation or hinted at this expectation of a divine Savior who would establish his kingdom of perfect righteousness upon the earth. Whatever advantages they had seat, sought in their life prior to this point, they'd sought from their idols. Their idols were primarily constructed to be delivery agents for what they wanted in life. And the idols of the Thessalonians were for them what they still are for people today. They're the mediums through which individuals pursue power and pleasure and prestige and protection. That's what idols are. The things you go in order to somehow empower yourself or in order to bring pleasure to yourself or in order to gain some level of power for yourself or something that you rest in in order to provide some sense of protection for yourself. And the Thessalonians were going to their idols to get all of these things. They were going to their idols to somehow protect themselves against bad luck and to get for themselves that kind of good luck that would bring advantages in their life and give them an upper hand in life. But when they came to Christ, they discovered that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't promise them any of those things in this life. That instead, he called them to die to themselves, to become weak so that he might be strong, to take up his cross and follow after him and be willing to suffer for his name's sake, to live not for their own privilege and honor and prestige, but to live for his glory and his honor alone, even in the midst of their suffering. He called them to turn away from a life of pursuing idols and to call to be separated from the world in which they lived, separated from the paths of power, the paths of pleasure, the paths of prestige and protection. But with this call, he extended to them this, this promise that they began to realize. He promised to them that the meek would inherit the earth, that those who suffered with him would reign with him, that those who served him would gain his well done, that at his right hand were pleasures forevermore, that those who gave all to follow him would gain all that he had, that his goodness and mercy would follow them all the days of their life and that they would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And they began to wait for that and long for that. The other thing that happens for a Christian is they take up this this life of wanting to live for God and honor God and serve God. And as they, they do, they begin to realize that their life becomes a, a light of the coming kingdom of God that has now come in their heart. And their, their, out of their inmost beings begins to pour out a, a, a stream, a river of the water of refreshing that one day will pour out from heaven's throne upon the earth. And they, they, they are excited about that. But over time, they begin to realize that the light they shine on the world in which they live is 
a pin light in comparison to the sunlight that will come upon the earth when Christ comes to reign. And that the, the water that they pour out of the life of the kingdom that they pour out on the world they live is, is like a cup poured out or a, a stream trickling out from their life compared to the day when God shall fulfill his promise that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord like the waters or the ocean covers the sea. The earth entirely will be covered with the knowledge of God like a great sweeping ocean of God's glory. And they long for that day. It's, oh God, it's good that I might shine your life, but oh, when the sun rises in this place. Oh God, I'm so glad that I can pour out your life upon this dry ground, but oh God, when the ocean of your presence is upon this earth. And they, they long for that. So they say, even Lord Jesus, we are waiting. Even so, Lord Jesus, please come. Have you ever prayed that God would revive this church? Have you ever said, God, send out the spirit of revival upon the church in this age? You know when you're doing that, you're not asking God to do something new. You're asking God to do something that he's done before in the life of the church. You're asking God to come how and move upon the church in such a way that we might begin to function and act and live as the church in different times when God's spirit was poured out, lived and functioned and carried out themselves. This waiting church in Thessalonica that lived with a longing for the coming of Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom, to be a waiting church, to be a waiting church. That may be one of the great expressions of God's reviving of his church. If God should revive his church in our day, one of the great identification marks of that church will be that it will become this dramatically, potently active and yet waiting body who's looking to heaven for and longing for the return of Jesus Christ. And if God should revive us in that way, I would like to describe to you what it would look like, what it would look like, and let's take a measure of it so we know how we ought to pray. First, the first thing it would look like is this. We would come together to practice the gathering that we will experience when the Lord Jesus calls us to meet him in the air. We'll come together to practice the gathering that we will experience when the Lord Jesus calls all of his to get redeemed together to meet him in the air. Paul begins a discussion of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 with these words. Just listen to them. It's very brief. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, the coming of our Lord, he's going to take up a discussion on this, but he just introduces it away. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him. The word gathering there is a word that is similar to the word that was used for synagogue. And that's what synagogue simply means, a gathering. And the word ecclesia from which we get the church name word church basically means the same thing. It just means a gathering of people. It's a gathering that mirrors our future. The church as it gathers is in seed form, an expression of the hope of the great and final gathering of the redeemed to the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming when he shall call out all those who he's died for and who have believed in him and the dead who have come before him first will be raised from their graves to meet him and then those who are alive at that time will also rise up to meet him in the air. The Bible says so, will sh so shall we ever be with the Lord. Actually, we read it in our scripture reading this morning, but let me... I wrote it down here. Let me read 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. When we gather together in our church, it's a hint. It's to be a living foreshadowing of that great day. That's why the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, 25, that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some are, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. When your eyes are on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and you intensely begin waiting for him, what happens in your life is a need not to be with the body of Christ less and less, but a longing to be with the body more and more because it's the one place where we are rehearsing the rapture of the church. 
We meet together in order to express, as Keith Bailey says in a little book he wrote called Christ Coming in His Kingdom, we meet together to be a dress rehearsal for His rapture. Let me tell you what the rapture is going to look like. The world is going to be behind us, and our king is going to be before us. (laughs) And our eyes are going to be on him, not on this world. And when we meet him and we gather before him in that air, if there's any consideration of the world, it's going to be this. He has still said that he's coming to lay his feet upon this earth and reign. And our one question will be, what will our mission be then? How will, you, how will we serve you, O Master and King, when you set up your kingdom upon this earth? Our eyes will be upon the Lord, not upon this world, but we'll want to know what our assignment should be. We'll not come to him saying, how can we navigate this earth to be as most successful as possible? How can we extrapolate from this age all of the advantages we can gain so that we can have as much privilege and power and pleasure and protection as we need in life? It will not be in our minds whatsoever. Those are the idols of this age, and they'll be behind us. Our eyes will just be upon our king. We'll have a question to ask about this earth and this world. It's how will we serve you there next? What will our mission be as you reign as king throughout this age? Now, a revived church has that same attitude. The world is behind us. We don't get together to calculate on how to deal with stress and how to become most successful and where to put our finances and what plan we should have for our retirement and how to somehow sequester all the advantages of this age. It's not the topic we're concerned with. Our eyes is on the king. Our worship is before him. And our one question is, how do we serve you in this age until that age comes? How can our lives now begin to reflect what our mission will be then? We gather for that reason. Here's the second thing. The revived and waiting church will be found waiting, as they're found waiting, will be preaching Christ and his salvation before the coming of Christ everywhere they go. We'll be busy preaching Christ and his salvation before he comes everywhere we go. The Lord Jesus, in the very last week of his life, spoke of the end of the age and the age to come when he would come and reign. And he he said in Matthew 24, verse 14, this, this would be a sign of his return. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. Lord, when are you going to return? Where are you going to come? Well, this gospel is going to be preached unto all the earth, and then I'll come. The waiting church, the church that's longing for the return of their king, gets gizzy, it becomes busy proclaiming the coming of the king. We follow the example of John the Baptist. John the Baptist knew at any moment the king was going to reveal himself. He came the first time in order to die for our sins. But he knew and he announced the coming of the king and he went about preaching the coming of that king and telling people to prepare themselves for his coming, his first coming. Now, the Bible says, Jesus said of ourselves, that we're greater than John the Baptist. But our message is very much the same. Our actions are to be the same. We're busy proclaiming, get ready for the coming of the king and his kingdom. Prepare yourselves, repent and believe. The king is on his way. A waiting church is a gospel proclaiming church. 2 Timothy verses 4 verses 1 and 2. Paul gives this charge. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, in light of his appearing and his coming kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, and with great patience or with great endurance and with instruction. The raiding church feels the urgency of the hour and the soon coming of the judge, and they are provoked by the spirit of Christ who is coming upon this earth. They are provoked to proclaim his gospel everywhere they go. When we read this passage, we have to be careful not to mistake that what's being said here. We might think, oh, this is a command for the preacher to make sure he preaches every single week a well-crafted message around the word of God. Now, that that might be a part of it. It would be important that I endure and keep and we expound this word above everything else week in, week out. And we've kind of whittled it down to one service, you know. When the church read this 200 years ago, they, they had a Sunday morning service and they had a Sunday evening service and Wait, they had, a, they had a Monday morning service and a Monday afternoon service and a Tuesday morning service and a Tuesday afternoon service. And a, was it? <laughs> they meant all the time preach the word. 
but if you read it that way, you're not quite understanding, I don't think. I think that it may include that, but I think in light of the coming of Jesus Christ, what we need to get out of this is that we're being commanded to get outside the walls of the church, and we're to get into the world that is quickly descending out of this day and into a final night, quickly moving from the moment in which they might receive Christ and turn to Christ and believe in Christ in which the curtain is going to fall and the judge is going to come and he's going to bring his judgment upon this earth with which in flaming fire, the Bible says, upon all who know not God nor believe his gospel. In light of that, we recognize that this Savior has already come for sin and is a rescuer from wrath and we are motivated because of the shortness of time to hurry to make Christ known and his salvation known to the ends of the earth. A waiting church is vigorously active and taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Can I just ask you? You have a lot of friends. You have got a lot of neighbors. You have, do you have a desire to see them come to Christ? Are you asking God, somehow God, give me some way to interject in their lives and proclaim in their lives and introduce in their lives the hope that lies within me? And the gospel message they need to have, they need to know and hear because time is quickly going by. Well, this brings us to the third thing. As a waiting church, we should be revived in our prayers in the midst of the world in which we live. Our prayers in a revived church would be careful and thought out and strategically laid upon the great purposes of God. I'm not saying that we wouldn't pray about small things like our daily bread. I'm saying that in all that we pray for, even those small things, we would thoughtfully consider how they best prepare us and the things we're seeking from God, how it best prepares ourselves in order that we might forward the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth, in order that we might proclaim the coming of the King, in order that we might give an expression to the one hope that the, lies before the world and the one terror that lies before the world as well. We would steward our prayers towards our essential calling to serve the Lord Jesus and to serve his people and to make his salvation known to as many as possible. Listen to these words in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. Here's what Peter says. In light of of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, what Peter says to a waiting church, the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Get your mind around the important things of the coming kingdom and pray in light of those things. Become intercessors who are weightily and strategically carrying out and thinking out their prayers in light of the shortness of the time of this age and the soon appearing of our Savior and the need to move more and more and more people to the place where they may be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and have their sins cleansed and they might be introduced into the light of an everlasting kingdom. They might have their sins washed away and where night may be turned to day. A revived church, a waiting church, will be a church of sound and sober prayer. Here's the fourth thing. A revived and waiting church will be renewed in its worship. <laughs> a revived and waiting church would be renewed in its worship. The day of Christ's coming is going to arrive, the Bible says, with the sound of a trumpet blast, and then we're going to be drawn together, and I guarantee you there we're going to worship the Lord Jesus, our lion and our lamb. And actually... If you look at Revelations chapter 4 and 5, you have this wonderful depiction of a worshiping church. I believe that what is presented for us there is the worship of the raptured church. I believe it's a portrait of the worship that will take place from the redeemed from the Old Testament and the New Testament who are drawn together to be with Christ in heaven. It's an interposition. It's the worship that takes place during what we would call the great tribulation before Christ returns at the end of that great tribulation in order, and we return with him in order to reign upon the earth. But during that time in which Christ is finishing up the last strategic movements of his judgments and his work in this historical age before he brings this reign upon the earth where the Bible says he'll reign for a thousand years. We get a picture of what we're going to be doing in his presence. Worshiping, worshiping the lion and the lamb. Revelations 4, or verses 6 through 11. Take your Bibles, let's read it there for a moment. So you can get an image and a picture of the worshiping church. 
in the presence of our Savior. Where you read of the 24 elders, I think that's a picture of the redeemed, 12 representing the tribes of Israel, the redeemed of the Old Testament, and 12 representing the apostles, the redeemed of this age, gathered together in thrones before the Lamb. Verse 6, beginning of verse 6 of Revelation chapter 4. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had the face of a man, like a man. The fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. It's very similar to the vision that you had in Isaiah chapter 6. And they do not rest day and night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, that's the church, and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. And by your will they exist and were created. And there's the worship that's taking place in the raptured church. Revelation chapter 5, go over there. Let me read to you verses 9 through 14. Pick up this theme of worship. There John has looked to see who it is that has prevailed in order to open up the scrolls to carry out the last and final plans of all of human history before the final establishment of God's kingdom and reign upon this earth. And he weeps because no one comes forward to open up the scroll. And they say, don't weep because there's one who's prevailed. And he looks to see one who is the Lion of Judah, and he looks to see one as a lamb who's been slain, who's been given power to open up the scroll and carry out God's sovereign plan over all of history and bring it to conclusion. And then he says this, speaking of the great multitude that's in that place in heaven at that time. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. This gospel shall be preached in all the earth and then the end shall come. You see, people of every tongue and every tribe and every nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, which is the church, and the number of them was now the elders are ten thousands times ten thousands and thousands and thousands. The, the representation of the body of Christ now swelled to an innumerable multitude before the throne, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. The praise of a revived and waiting church will be an eschatological forecast to the worship that will one day rise up in all of heaven as we watch the great orchestration of our king bringing about the final stages of human history and then taking up the plans to rule and reign upon the earth. And in anticipation of that day, we will cry out and worship and rejoice and praise him. And when we worship him here, it ought to be an expression of that hope and that longing and that waiting and that confident promise. Our songs of praise ought to mingle with the voices we will raise one day together with all before the throne of our Lord Jesus Christ. There will be a change in our praising. By the way, it won't be a fixation upon ourselves. We won't sing songs about what we're doing. We won't sing songs about what we're feeling. We won't be taking our pulse. We'll just be saying, worthy is the Lamb. Our eyes will be upon Him. We'll exalt Him in His name and His triumph and His glory. It will be the essence of our worship and our praise, and it ought to be still today. The revived and waiting church is renewed in its worship in the presence of an anticipation and an expression, a wonderful prophetic expression 
of the worship that will be ours one day. Think about it. One day, Christ is going to return. The Bible says he's coming for us, his bride. And at that moment, he will be glorified among us. But not only that, we will be glorified before him. Every vestige of sin will be removed from our lives. Our body will somehow sprout up to be something we've never known it to be or imagined to be radiating with the glorious transference of our life into the very presence of Jesus Christ and his life in us so that there will be no sin in us and we will radiate his righteousness that he has clothed us with. And in that moment, we're going to praise him. We're going to say, oh, Jesus, you're so wonderful. Oh, God, how glorious is your salvation. And our praise today should then be an expression of that day of praise, that endless day of praise. And it becomes that when God renews within us this great waiting desire by reviving us. Here's the last thing. The revived and waiting church will find its celebration of the Lord's table will turn to focus on the future coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This celebration will be directed towards the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 26. Paul writes this, in giving instructions about the communion table that's before us. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then Paul writes this explanation. For as often as you drink this bread, you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You have your eye on the return of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus said when he was celebrating this meals with his disciples, I won't celebrate this feast with you again until I celebrate with you in glory. We long for that time. We don't have Christ's physical presence with us at this time. We can't tangibly see him. We can't tangibly touch him. We don't taste with him in a sense the experience of that great feast one day. We'll eat with him. And so what the Lord Jesus has done is given us the physicality of his presence in this table. While he's absent from us in the body, he has given us this table where these symbols allow us and lead us into a consideration of a, of a tangible exercise of his presence among us with our eyes on the second coming when it will be fully realized. And so we hold in our hands the expression of his body and his presence. We take to our lips the taste of the great feast that he'll give us one day in his presence. We observe it and we see it and these things are reminders that though Christ is here with us spiritually one day we shall see him face to face one day we shall cling to him and hold him again we shall lay our hands upon the pierced feet of the one who's died for us in adoration and page and we'll feel the feet and we'll sense it and we'll know it and all these things will not be simply things that we know intellectually or things that we know mystically and wonderfully, but we'll know them in tangible reality. And until that moment, God has given us this meal as a tangible exercise, some sense in which through sight and through taste, we want to remind ourselves that one day we shall be with him and see him and feast with him in that great day. And as we do, we long for his coming. We long for his coming. We long for his coming. The Lord Jesus, at the beginning of the book of Revelation, sent out seven letters to the churches. These letters suggested that his eyes were searching through those churches at that time. He was seeing what was going on. He knew what was taking place. And he only brings a commendation to two of those churches. Five of them he pronounces rather stern judgments and warnings to them. John actually gives us a picture of Christ as he's watching over the churches and presiding over the churches in judgment. Remember, judgment first begins with the house of God. And the image that John gives us of Christ searching over the churches is a rather startling and terrifying image. It's found in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And again, I read it to you as a concluding thought. John describes this Lord with his searching eye upon the church. He says, Then I turned to see the voice of who, he who was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, which were a reflection of these churches, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed in a robe reaching down to the feet 
girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished or burning bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. This is our Savior. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the one who walks to judge the life of the church, and his life is in this place. Before he left and went to establish himself and prepare the kingdom that he's bringing upon the earth, he told us that we were to be vigilant, that we were to live our eyes, live with our lives serving him and with our eyes upon his coming. He wanted us to find us waiting for him and longing for that return, and he left us to be a waiting church. And now he looks down upon us. Is that what he sees? Is that what he sees? Could we be a waiting church, longing for his return? Could we want to be together more and more because he's coming soon? Could we bind together to want to see more and more people come to Christ? Could we agree together that we would strategically pledge ourselves to pray for lost friends and family members day in and day out and support one another in those sober judgments and those sober prayers? Could we gather together and release ourselves in the worship that one day we'll experience before his throne in great anticipation? Could we eat this meal together until he comes with our eye on his coming? Even so, Lord Jesus, move us in this place. Your redemption is drawing near. Find us waiting. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. God, I pray that you would rescue the body of Christ from any sense of being cavalier in the time of your near approach, of being inattentive to that moment and that hour. Instead, oh God, what we want more than everything else is at this moment for you to pour out your spirit upon us so that our light lamps might be shining bright in anticipation of your return. May this bride in this place longingly look to you and may we also endeavor to bring others to look to that place and to the clouds of our Lord's return. Lord, would we believe that this sense of anticipation, this waiting community could be us again? It was that waiting church that lived in that dark age and yet their lives eventually became the turning point for the nations. Their lives became a great blessing for the ages. Our world through the intervening two millennia, has benefited from a church that learned to wait and long for you. They brought life and they brought the promise of that kingdom nearer than it will be experienced until Christ comes upon the earth as they waited. May we recognize, dear God, that our greatest benefit that we can give to this age and this world is not with our eyes fixed upon this world alone, but our eyes fixed upon the heavens for the sun. Thank you, Jesus that you might find us washed and cleansed by your blood, bound in an unending relationship with you, ready to receive you and ready to be received by you in that last day. May that be the case for all here. May that be what we testify now in this meal before us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.